Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on scientific software and libraries for electronic structure community. So it's a bit uh, like to, to make it clear. So it's not, it was intended about a webinar about CP2K, but because we are not main CP2K developers and because the CP2K code is just too huge to be presented in one hour. So we decided to instead to present our effort on uh, scientific libraries for CP2K and also for other electronic structure codes in the hope that it will be useful for you as well. Uh, and uh, so today with me, so the webinar will be presented by Shoshana Jakobovic, Marko Kabic and Simon Frasch. So we are all from CSCS, from the group of scientific software and libraries. And uh, so what so we're going to do now is this. So I will give a short brief uh, outline of uh, of the motivation so why we do things and so what we develop and so then uh, Shoshana will give a presentation about DBCSR library which is a workhorse for CP2K and Marco will give a talk about Cosmo library which is now very uh, useful for RPA calculations in CP2K and then Simon Frasch will talk about FFT implementation for HPC. Uh, so let's uh, let's now move forward and uh, so one thing so I wanted to tell you is that after this webinar so the carry away message for you would be that uh, so we are developing libraries and if you have something to if you start a project or if you do uh, some code optimizations you should be aware of what the things that we do at CSCS and maybe you should not start from scratch but take our effort and use it. So uh, who we are? So we are Swiss National Supercomputer Center. So we are located, our headquarters are in Lugano, but we also have a small office, maybe with 30 people at the northern part of Switzerland at ETH Zurich. Our headquarters, so have this nice and fancy building and besides this building, so there's a big, big machine room. And inside this machine room, there is plenty of systems and clusters and computers and our flagship supercomputer pits died which actually until two or three days ago was the number one supercomputer in europe but two days ago we lost this place now we're number three but still so it's a very huge installation and so the first version of pits died we got in 2013 so it was a craig's c30 system with 5,000 plus nodes equipped with NVIDIA K20X. And in 2016, we upgraded Pits Dined uh, to, to, to Haswell and NVIDIA P100 GPU cards. And so this is where we drain all the power. So our power comes from the GPU cards. And if we have a look at the user lab, so number of uh, communities, so users who who run at Pits Dined, uh, we will see that like chemistry and materials take about 38%. And from this 38% of, of, of all the jobs that are run at, at Pits Dined, a lot of these jobs are CP2K and Quantum Express. So these are two very, very popular codes that are used by many, many users in Switzerland. So CP2K, if you don't know, CP2K is a localized Gaussian basis set. So it's actually Gaussian plus plane waves, but it's a localized basis. Uh, it uses sparse matrix multiplication for if you do order n method, if you don't do the, do not do diagonalization. If you want to do diagonalization, so you use dense eigen solver like Scala, Paco, Elpa. Uh, if you want to do post uh, DFT calculations like RPA, so for this part you need a matrix matrix multiplication of a huge distributed matrix and also it needs some FFTs but uh, it's not a not a crucial part at the examples that we run at the moment. Uh, Quantum Espresso is a delocalized plane wave basis uh, set method so it uses pseudo potentials and plane waves it's very heavily it very heavily relies on FFT so if you have a FFT driver so it needs to be working perfectly well and uh, it does there's some subspace diagonalization so it does a lot of linear algebra and uh, it relies on dense Aiken solver and so the question that we have at CSCS is how we can help 
employing structured community and other communities to uh, port scientific applications to, to GPUs because that's a challenge. So if you did this once yourself, so you will, so you know that, so you have to, you typically have a Fortran code, so with a lot of inheritance, and usually, or very often, it's a monolithic all-in-one code with like Scala pack and Blast supplied so that you can compile it everywhere on X386 machines. Uh, usually it's MPI with OpenMP code and usually it doesn't have a GPU support or very often there is no GPU support on this kind of codes. And so you have to do a lot of work to make them run on GPU. So you have to refactor them, clean up, make uh, like work on computer intensive kernels, port them and when you port them so you can do a lot of there are different ways how you can do it with OpenACC, with OpenMP, with CUDA, or CUDA Fortran with OpenCL and typically users are not, they do not have time to do so, to do so. So they are busy with the science and they are not willing to, to work on GPUs. And uh, at CSCS, what we promote is this so-called separation of concerns or separation of work. So what we would like to have is that the codes which were monolithic Fortran codes or monolithic C codes that they are split into more lightweight scientific part and and the rest which is encapsulated into libraries and so when you have this separation the computer scientists like Shoshana, Mark and Simon they can start working on the libraries without a deep knowledge of the physics of the codes and what they do inside codes and that's what we promote is our as our vision so we would like to work on libraries and we would like to have libraries optimized for different backends because now we have gpus and top supercomputer now is arm based and who knows in in few years what will be the architecture so scientific codes cannot have all the backends for all the architectures and this should be encoded in the libraries and so with this, I will pass a word to Shoshana as the first example of the separation between the scientific code and the library. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. My name is Shoshana Jakobovitz. I'm a software engineer at CSCS. I work in Anton's team, the scientific software and libraries team. And my work at CSCS in the last two years has focused on the DBCSR library. Um, more particularly, it's GPU backend. And I'm thrilled to tell you a little more about DBCSR, how DBCSR interacts with CP2K in the next 10 minutes or so that we have ahead of us in the context of this Max webinar. Great, let's start with the basics. What does DBCSR stand for? Well, the D in DBCSR stands for distributed. It is uh, MPI parallelization is based on the Canon algorithm, and we also have on-node parallelization with OpenMP. Then the BCSR in DBCSR stands for blocked compressed sparse row. Don't be too scared by these weird words. Compressed sparse row is just the format that sparse matrices use to be represented, and blocked means that we look at blocked sparse matrices. More on that later. What does DBCSR do? Well, DBCSR does sparse matrix matrix multiplication, SPGEM, as well as a bunch of other linear algebra operations. And more recently, um, DBCSR has been augmented with a tensor contractions framework. I don't know too much about that, so I won't, uh, I won't go into details, but you can look at more recent papers or um, ask me for references and I can guide you to some if you want to know more about tensor contractions in DBCSR. What else is there to know about this library? Um, it's written in Fortran. It is GPU accelerated both for NVIDIA and AMD GPUs via CUDA and HIP. Anton emphasized the importance of GPUs for CSCS in his introduction and DBCSR is definitely uh, in that line. DBCSR was first written as a part of CP2K, so it was literally a part of the CP2K code, um, but it is now released as a standalone and you can see uh, again what, I'm, what uh, Anton emphasized in his uh, introduction, the importance of separation of concerns and building smaller libraries that target specific problems. DBCSR is such an example. So it was extracted out of CP2K and is now released as a standalone library, which you can find and just use on its own or in some other codes. Um, before we dive into what DBCSR is about, let me show you a couple of code snippets so you have an idea of what DBCSR code might look like. DBCSR has both a Fortran API as well as a C API. I'll show you the Fortran API because that's the one that is used inside CP2K and is just a little more frequently used, but you could also build DBCSR with a C API if that was something that you were interested in. 
Great. When you call VBCSR, you start by initializing the library. You might give it the number of um, block rows, column rows that the matrix will contain. You might allocate these things. Um, next, you might uh, set the row and column distributions. Um, here, they're just uh, set randomly because this is just some example, but you could do something different, of course. Um, and then you can set the DBCSR distribution object. Next, you might actually create a matrix, um, giving it a name, a distribution, a matrix type, as well as the row block size, the column block size, um, data types, various data types are supported as well. So these are the types of things you might specify when you create a DBCSR matrix. You then might set up the matrix. This is a bit of a scary example, um, but it just uh, randomly sets some non-zero elements here and there. You might do this however you want to do it in your own code. And finally, once your matrix is all set up, you could finalize the DBCSR matrix. You could multiply two matrices A and B and store the result in a matrix C um, with specifying a bunch of different parameters uh, depending on, uh, on what exactly you're doing. You could print matrices, release matrices, and that is more or less what uh, multiplying two matrices in DBCSR uh, could look like. If you're interested in installing and uh, DBCSR yourself, uh, DBCSR is relatively easy to install. It doesn't have that many requirements. You might need CMake and either GNU Make or Ninja. You just need a BLAS or LAPAC implementation. Um, if you're running on a supercomputer or some cluster, preferably one that is uh, optimized for your system, but otherwise anyone would uh, theoretically do. Optionally, you could have a Libx SMM, which is a specialized library for Intel processors. More on that later as well. Um, and you might also, you will of course need a Fortran compiler, a C++ compiler. Um, and if you wanted a CUDA or a HIP backend, you might need compilers for those as well. And then you could simply build by running relatively simple CMake command with a bunch of options and then build. That is about DBCSR, um, how, you, how you might use it. Um, so the natural sort of use case for DBCSR is electronic structure, although, you know, sparse matrix multiplications can be found in a number of different domains, both in finite elements and computational fluid dynamics, climate simulations, big data, or more case, more things. Um, but as I told you, DBCSR was originally part of CP2K, and it really was written by and for CP2K developers, um, because these types of sparse matrices are really, really crucial to CP2K's calculations. What type of sparse matrices am I talking about? You can look at the drawing that I, well, the sort of representation that I put here on the right. This is a simple representation of what an H2O, uh, you know, um, molecule might look like uh, if, you, if you represented it as a matrix. Um, and you can see that different atoms correspond to different blocks inside of the matrix. Again, this is just a representation. Don't take it at face value. Um, but what this might tell you is that DBCSR is based on blocked structure, meaning that the sparse matrices that DBCSR deals with, or the type of sparse matrices that DBCSR particularly excels uh, at dealing with, is the ones that are based on blocked structures where, you know, a large chunk of your matrix is just zeros, and you have these little dense blocks of non-zero elements scattered around your big large matrices. Typically, um, these blocks are a rather small size, you know, like 13 times 13, 23 times 23, uh, these types of sizes up to, you know, maybe 70 or so, something like that. Um, and DBCSR tries to take full advantage of the block structured sparse nature of these matrices uh, in order to get the full performance on uh, on both on CPUs and on GPUs. Um, what does DBCSR software look like? Well, here's a, you know, a, a, a graphical representation, possibly a DBCSR software structure. At the top level, you see, well, DBCSR is distributed. Um, its MPI parallelization is based on Canon, and there's sort of a layer that handles the load balancing between MPI nodes. If you travel sort of lower to the north node level, you have um, cache optimization layers, batch generation layers, scheduler layers, and then you see both a host driver and a device driver. Um, these two drivers sort of figure out whether batches of matrix, local matrices to, to multiply have to be sent to CPU or to GPU. Um, on CPU, you have two multiplication drivers, uh, BLAS and Libix SMM. Libix SMM is one that is um, particularly well suited for Intel uh, CPUs. And on the device driver side, you have a core HIP BLAS backend, which could just use these vendor-provided libraries to do the local multiplications, as well as LibSMM ACK. 
Um, LibSMM ACK is the, the GPU driver that is sort of uh, custom written for DBCSR. Because what I work on at, C at CSCS is this library, I'd love to use a couple more minutes to talk about that, because that is really the part of the code that I know uh, the best. And afterwards, I'll tell you a little bit more about some performance benchmarks and other uh, interesting details. So this is the part of the code that we are going to look at in the next couple of minutes. Um, on the left, you see a representation of what two matrices at DBCSR multiplies might look like. It has these sort of red dense blocks that are the dense blocks of non-zero elements. First, it might make a list of all of the different blocks that have to be multiplied to each other, and then it creates stacks saying, you know, here are all of the 23 times 5 matrices that I have to multiply and all of the 13 times 18 matrices that I have to multiply. And these, um, this sort of builds large batches of matrices that have to be multiplied on the GPU. Before being multiplied on the GPUs, they are jitted, so just in time compiled on the fly, depending on the types of matrices and sizes of matrices that uh, come up in the run. And they are then written back to matrix C. Now, multiplying these small blocks is very tricky in terms of performance, which is why DBCSR uses highly parameterized kernels in order to do that. They're parameterized over a, a number of parameters that you see here on the slide on the left. But the performance is very difficult to model, and there are trade-offs and interactions between parameters that are very, very difficult to predict a priori. Um, this is illustrated in the following slide, where you see the run of just one particular batched matrix, the batched matrix of five times six times a six times six matrix, and the spread of performances that you might obtain by varying the parameters in this batch multiplication is very, very large. You see that we go from a couple of gigaflops all the way up to 275 gigaflops, depending on the parameter sets used. And of course, the kernel that we want to have in our library, this winner kernel, is the top one here, uh, where the, the uh, where there are very few kernels at that high performance. So how do we do to find these winner kernels? Well, we use auto-tuning data augmented with kernel and hardware-derived features to train a machine learning model that can accurately predict optimal parameters for a new matrix-matrix multiplication dimensions. Um, and this combination of auto-tuning and machine learning allows us to find very good uh, parameters all the way across the um, space of different matrix sizes that we want to multiply. Here is a, let's turn to some performance numbers. I told you earlier that DBCSR really shines um, in uh, CP2K's linear scaling SCF cell consistent field calculations. Here is a graph from a paper that came out in 2012, uh, linear scaling self consistent field calculations with millions of atoms in the condensed phase. The dashed lines show you the ideal linear scaling that you want to observe. The solid lines with different colors um, show you the actual measured numbers for different methods uh, in the simulation. This is a simulation um, of bulk liquid water uh, and its energy calculation. And you can see how this uh, linear scaling is, uh, goes all the way up into a very large number of atoms. And this is mostly due or, you know, uh, is, is largely the work of DBCSR since these calculations are really dominated by the sparse matrix matrix multiplication. So this is an example of um, where DBCSR really, really shines inside CP2K calculations. Um, in this uh, graph, we're sort of zooming in, not into CP2K, but into just DBCSR alone. So DBCSR, um, and more specifically into its GPU backend, into the performance of batched matrix matrix multiplication kernels. On the x-axis, you see different matrix dimensions, also different sort of sizes uh, that we are batch multiplying. And on the y-axis, the, the measured performance. The three different colors show you this, these numbers on three different GPUs, the NVIDIA P100, as well as the NVIDIA V100, and the AMD MI50. And you can see that for sizes, even you know, small sizes such as 32 times 32 times 32, uh, DBCSR frequently achieves half of peak performance on these high-class GPUs. As I told you, DBCSR is available as a standalone. It is actively developed on GitHub by uh, myself and a lot of other people in Zurich and around the world. It is well documented, relatively easy to use and to install. Check it out on GitHub. Um, and it is also delivered automatically with any CP2K installation. So if you have been running CP2K, you have also been running DBCSR, perhaps without even knowing it. Thank you very much. I I think um, Antal is now going to pick a couple of questions out of the chat box. And yes, once we've was... looked at a couple of questions, I'll pass the word to Manko. Yes, I think so. We have time for one good question. So it, it appeared in a different chat. So how mature is the HIP backend for DBCSR? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it is mature enough to be in the latest DBCSR release. Um, it is not yet part of our continuous integration testing. 
Um, and there are some performance issues that we are still working on. So it is, I'd say, entirely usable. Um, performance might not be entirely satisfactory or not entirely, you know, at the level of the CUDA backend because it's definitely not as mature as the CUDA backend, but it is, you know, entirely usable. I encourage you to use it and to also open issues on GitHub if you have any, uh, you know, feedback on that or things you'd like to notice because we are very interested in uh, ironing out the last issues and figuring out how we can make the performance better. So please go ahead and use it, give us feedback. Thanks, Shoshan. I think so. There are a couple of more questions that you can answer in, by typing. So in, in a Fantastic. Written form. I'll do so. Good. And so then we go to Marco and the Cosmo right. library. I'll just share this uh, just to steal the screen. <laughs> uh, yep. Yep. Okay, so let's let's talk about Cosma. Cosma is a matrix multiplication library. And we might wonder, um, do we really need yet another matrix multiplication? So if you look at the efforts and uh, development of different algorithms for matrix multiplication over time, we can see that each next algorithm was actually reducing the communication volume. So the communication cost of the algorithms, but none of them was actually reaching the theoretical lower bound that we can see here in the plot. And Cosma is actually doing exactly that. So Cosma is the first matrix multiplication uh, algorithm that is uh, communication optimal, so probably communication optimal for any matrix shapes and any available resources. Now let's say that you have your own code and you want to use Cosma. So what are your uh, possibilities? Well, maybe your code already uses the Scalapack layout. In this case, you're lucky because Cosma provides the Scalapack, Scalapack API, which has both C and Fortran interfaces. And in this case, you don't have to make changes to your code. You can just uh, link your code to Cosma and readily use the Scalapack API. However, to get the most of the performance, maybe you might want to consider to actually adapt your code to use the Cosma layout. Now here by layout, we uh, primarily mean the way how your matrices are distributed among the, the ranks, the processor or the nodes. So uh, if you're willing to change your code, then you can get the most of the performance. And maybe your code actually uses um, a custom layout. So maybe your matrices are distributed in um, your own way. In this case, Cosmo is actually able to adapt to your own layout. Regarding the backends, Cosmo is GPU accelerated and um, the GPU backend supports both NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. So let's now just focus on the front end part and forget about the rest. Um, it's just important to mention that if you're using Scalapack layout, um, then you don't have to change uh, your code at all. You just link to Cosma and that's it. And the integration effort you have to put uh, increases um, as you go to other layouts, but also the performance gains increase. So the more effort you put into the integ integration, the more performance you will gain. So let's now just focus on the Scalapack layout. So if you want to use it, you can follow the 30 seconds tutorial. And basically it's very simple. You just need to compile Cosma, which is just running some CMake and make commands. And you just have to link to Cosma afterwards. Um, when you link, it's just important that you link to Cosma before you link to Scalapack. And that's it. So you're ready to go. Uh, this is how we actually used it in CP2K and the CP2K code was completely untouched. So just it was just linked to Cosma. Now, just to give you an idea of how much overhead this Scalapack layout has to Cosma is that in the moment of PDGEM invocation, so PDGEM is matrix multiplication of Scalapack, Scalapack has already created the, the communication grid, the processor grid, right? And it can start the multiplication. Whereas Cosma is just about to start creating the communicators, allocating memory, solving the perfect matching problem. It's something deep down inside. To transform the data layouts to Cosma layout, transpose if necessary, multiply, and then free up the memory. Um, however, you can still get some decent performance. And to illustrate this, we ran a benchmark on 256 nodes. Um, we took a square matrix multiplication with a square um, block cyclic distribution with transpose and also with square processor grid. So everything was just the way the Scalapack likes. And what we got here is that this is, the, this is showing the throughput for different matrix dimensions. And so here higher is better because we want uh, more um, gigaplots, right? We got that actually Cosma was 
two times faster on CPU than MKL. So MKL here is in gray. And Cosmo on GPU was um, around three times faster than MKL. Okay, but now, you know, this is in isolation. We wanted to check if the same holds also when Cosmo is used within CP2K, so within the Ryu user application. So we chose to run uh, RPA benchmark, which is run of phase approximation simulation of 128 water molecules in CP2K. So what is, what is the bottleneck of this uh, simulation is actually a very big matrix multiplication. So we have like shared dimension 3.5 million and 17.5K is a small dimension and there is also transposition. And this multiplication is performed 46 times uh, inside of this simulation. So what did we get? So here um, we show the timing for different um, used algorithms. So here lower is better because we want um, time to solution to be short. This is benchmark on 128 nodes. And the blue part here, which you can see, is actually showing the PD gen time, so the time spent in matrix multiplication, whereas the orange part is actually um, other parts that are included in simulations, in simulation like Cholesky decomposition and others. Um, we ran different algorithms, so Cosma, Kralip, Psi, EC, MKL, and Kralip, Psi. The first two are GPU accelerated. What can we see here? Um, PDGEM part was 25% faster with Cosma than with Kralip, Psi, EC. And uh, comparing to MKL, PDGEM part is seven times faster with Cosma and three times faster in total time. So the blue part is seven times faster and the total is three times faster than MKL. So this is just without any change of the code, just the linking to Cosma. Now we you know, focused on these two algorithms like Cosma and Kralip, Psi, EC, run the same benchmark on more nodes, on 1,000 1, nodes. And as soon as we got to 1,000 nodes, we can actually see that um, Cosma was like double faster than Kralip, Psi, EC. Uh, they are both uh, GPU accelerated. Um, what, what is interesting here is that um, not just the PDGEM part, so the matrix multiplication part is faster, but also the total time of the simulation. And why is that? Well, um, it's because Cosma is actually, uh, actually PDGEM is also used in Cholesky decomposition. And so actually um, also the PDGEMs within Cholesky are also using Cosma if you link to Cosma first. So actually Cosma can also help in other parts of the simulation. Okay. So that was the Scalapac layout. Now we can just, I will give you a short teaser on the custom layout. Uh, let's say that you have your own matrices that are distributed in a very unusual way, uh, like this. So here each color corresponds to a, a separate rank. So let's say that here rank two owns this piece of A, then these two pieces of B and uh, this piece of C. So um, I just want to say that it's um, Cosma can handle it. And the only thing you have to do is you have to describe to Cosma the matrix layouts. And the matrix um, descriptor of Cosma is actually just expecting you to give the row slices. So where these ticks are and also the column slices. That's the global view and also the local view. Let's say for rank two, it would be for each local block. It expects a pointers and also the strides of these blocks. So once you describe these, um, Cosma can just handle this multiplication for you. And another teaser is um, why you might want to consider using the native Cosma layout. Well, we performed a bunch of benchmarks for different uh, matrix shapes. Um, and also we compared it to other state-of-the-art algorithms and we measured the speed up, right? The Cosma was always the fastest one and the uh, least speed up it, ach it achieved was 7%. And um, the most speed up we got was that Cosma was almost 13 times faster than the second best, in which case it was Scalapac. So Scalapac is the second best. So if you really want to get serious speed up, you might want to consider using the native Cosma layout. I just want to say in the end that uh, this work was done in collaboration with Professor Thorsten Höpfer from ETH, and that this work got the Best Student Paper Award at the Supercomputing Conference in Denver. Here you can find some useful slides and also if you have some questions, you can also drop me an email. So thanks, that's, that's it. Now we can maybe just uh, see if there are any questions. We can um, reply.
Marco, I think there were no questions regarding Cosma. So yep. I think it's either people, it's all clear to, to people or Opa. Yep. <laughs> it's yep. like few users that can potentially benefit the Cosma at the moment, but yeah, yeah. Yes. no worries. <laughs> yeah, so if you have a big distributed matrix multiplication and for example, you compute the free greens function, which involves the summation over electron hole pairs. Uh, ah, so John Guillaume asking is how Cray reacts about its results. Hi, the, the, the Cray, Cray lips I mean, they are informed. And so they, um, they contacted Alfio Alazaro, and I even think he, they will install it on uh, Pete Stein and possibly also other supercomputers. So I think they're, they're just fine. <laughs> Good, okay. One more question so we can take. Uh, have you compared performance of Cosmo and MKL on CPU? Have you compared performance of Cosmo versus MKL on CPU only? Yes, yeah, this is, this is also a good question. So we, um, we compared um, in isolation, we compared it and it was a similar speed up. So like four times or so, but um, within the CP2K application uh, for these specific test cases, there was like on the 128 nodes, a 10% difference. So Cosmo was 10% faster uh, for this 128 uh, RPA benchmark. However, on, on more nodes, uh, it's expected to have more um, more speed up, but we didn't uh, test it further, so we just stopped there. Okay, Marco, thank you very much. Okay. And so, other questions? I think so you can sure. so you can uh, ask Marco in the chat, and uh, we will and now I'm, yeah passing my work to Simon Frasch. He's talking yes, about exactly his so. sparse FFT. Library. FFT is is a corner uh, like a big problem for plane wave codes. Simon, please. Yes, thank you. So yes, uh, my name is Simon Frasch. Um, I also work at CSCS in the same group with Anton. And I developed a, a library which targets a specific FFT problem that you commonly have in computational and material science codes. Um, so let me just start to, to show you what the problem is. That in what you typically have is that you want to compute a 3D FFT, um, but your input is sparse in a sense. So what you, for example, may have is a sphere of non-zero elements in a box. Um, and if you were to use uh, standard FFT libraries like FFTW, then you would be doing a lot of wasted computational effort by transforming uh, zero elements. So what is then typically done is make use of the fact that you can compose a 3D FFT by three 1D FFTs along each dimension. And if you start from a sphere, then if you transform the first dimension, you only have to transform in a sense a cylinder using dense 1D FFTs. Um, and then from the cylinder in the next dimension, you go sort of to a slab and, and only the final dimension, you have to go along the entire box. So there you save quite a bit of computational effort. And SPFFT does not limit itself to, to a sphere or any specific shape. It, it uh, can be used um, with any kind of uh, sparse input data. And the design goals of the library were that it supports also distributed computation, so using MPI. Um, what you also often have is that you want to compute um, transforms of different sizes. So there it offers the opportunity to use shared resources um, also, um, more specific to, to the computational material science codes is that you, when you describe your sparse input data, um, you have sort of indexing that's shifted with the, uh, the centered zero frequency. So the indices can be negative to positive. It's also support, supported natively. And if you do want to compute complex real transforms, it does uh, make use of the full emission symmetry property. Um, that's in comparison to, for example, if you do a dense transform with FTW, then it makes use of the symmetry property mostly by sort of halving um, the amount of frequencies that you have, but not entirely because there's one plane where you could still make more use of the symmetry. And, and for here, with this library, um, with the sparse input, can make full use of this property. And the implementation is done in C++. 
the only really mandatory dependency in terms of libraries is an FFTW implementation. So it's either, either FFTW itself or um, something like NKL. And then there's optional parallelization and acceleration with OpenMP, MPI, CUDA, or ROCKM with HIP. Um, now, if you use MPI, then with FFT libraries, it's always a question of how you uh, decomposition your data among all those MPI ranks. Um, typically choices here are slab decomposition or pencil decomposition. For slab decomposition, you um, yeah, have slabs of the data and do a, you can do it in a single MPI exchange, um, but it's more limited in terms of how many ranks you can actually, how many ranks can actually hold data. And pencil decomposition um, will have this, uh, um, decomposes the box into pencils, which then allows you to do sort of uh, these transpose operations with MPI in, in sub-communicators, but you have at least two steps, two communication steps. Now, what I went with um, for this library with the sparse input is that I essentially use the communication pattern of a slack decomposition, but on the sparse input side, um, um, I'm using sort of a flexible pencil decomposition. So. The only limitation in terms of how sparse data is um, distributed among MPI ranks is that a single pencil or column, the data has to be on one MPI rank, but those pencils can be distributed in any kind of fashion. And then when transforming them into sort of dense data, um, then there is a slab decomposition. This sort of has less constraints on the distribution um, and is also better suited for GPU acceleration because when you do the MPI exchange, you depending on how you do it, uh, you also have to uh, send the data back to the host and, and then back to the GPU, which uh, costs time. So if you were to use a pencil decomposition, that you would have to pay that price twice. Uh, disadvantage, as I said, is uh, yeah, limited limited number of MPI ranks in terms of uh, how many can actually hold dense data. And for the MPI step, there are three options available to use um, that you can configure the library with. Um, so the MPI all to all, which is just fi fixed message sizes. This is best when you have sort of a uniform data distribution as often in terms of MPI implementation, uh, the best optimized. Then you have the M MPI all to all V, which sort of has uh, variable message sizes between each rank. So if you have a non-uniform um, distribution, that's the better choice. And it's also the default um, by, within the library. And then there is optionally also the all to all W where um, internally one can skip a step of packing and unpacking data from the send and receive buffer by using custom MPI data types. And for my benchmarking, it's uh, faster in some specific use cases. Um, otherwise, usually the other two methods are the better choice. And then some optional features are that when packing and unpacking the data for the MPI exchange, the um, library can be told to convert the data from double position to single position, uh, which halves the amount of data that has to be sent, but introduces uh, some truncation error uh, that you have between the transforms. Um, and also optionally, if you if CUDA where MPI is available, this can also be used. You can make use of uh, speed up of, by using GPU direct. Um, and the interface is built uh, with two constructs. So a grid handle, which sort of represents the allocated resources um, and can be used with any transform handle then up to a given size. And a transform handle is then associated with the actual transform size, fixed transform size, you provide the indices of the sparse input once at the creation of the handle. So then you can just uh, uh, execute the same transform multiple times with minimal overhead. And also um, to avoid sort of any exposure of GPU a specific uh, API for CUDA or ROPM, um, it allows you to simply provide pointers and then internally it checks whether these are host or divine po device pointers and goes from there. So you can do transforms from host to host memory using the GPU, but also from GPU to GPU or any combination. 
And here I have a brief example of how using SPF50 from Fortran looks like. So SPF50 provides a C++ interface, but also a C interface and a corresponding Fortran module. And um, when you use SPF50, you first create a grid with where you have the maximum dimensions um, and provide, specify sort of the exchange method underneath, sort of which MPI call to use. And then you create a transform handle with the actual indices and the actual transform size. Um, you can destroy the grid handle at once because in generally the resources are uh, only freed once also all the transform handles are destroyed. Um, one thing to note is that for the dense data, the uh, library actually does the allocation. So um, to, you, to get access to the dense data, uh, you want to query the, query the uh, library and then make the C pointer sort of readable from Fortran by converting it to a Fortran array of sorts. And then you can do any number of backwards and forward transforms. It also supports um, scaling. So if you enable scaling, then doing a backwards and forward transform, you will have exactly the same data afterwards. So, and this example was taken from, uh, in part from a Quantum Espresso FT mini app, um, which I'm going to show a brief benchmark later on. But first, uh, comparison with, um, for a dense transform in this case, uh, with FFTW, with MPI. So uh, in Pittstein, we have uh, two types of nodes, a GPU node with, uh, with an index Xeon with 12 cores and an NVIDIA Tesla P100 and a, a multi-core node with um, two uh, inter Xeon processors with 18 cores each. So in this benchmark, this is a multi-thread benchmark where uh, MKL provides sort of the FFTW implementation. And if you compare the blue line of MKL with the purple line uh, with the same configuration with SPFT, SPFT is actually slightly faster and you might wonder why that's the case with a, with a dense input. Uh, that's because um, since it specializes on sparse input, it actually for the dense case, it uses twice as much memory. So it can internally play ping pong between two buffers and then have uh, better strides uh, for the transforms along each dimension. So you see, depending on the transform size, actually a slight speed up to the battery FFTW. Um, I guess the interesting part is here that once you switch to GPU nodes and use GPU acceleration, and if you look at the um, green line, then you're actually slower than on the multi-core node. Um, that's because here you actually really have to pay the cost for transferring data back onto the host uh, for the MPI exchange. But if you use uh, GPU direct, so CUDA where MPI, um, the performance is much better and actually beats the multi-core nodes. And uh, one comparison to an implementation that actually does essentially the same thing in terms of uh, how it treats the sparse input is done with the uh, implementation in Quantum Expresso itself. Um, so here I ran the mini app and integrated SPFFT uh, for comparison purposes. And on the left side, you see some timings where you have one thread per rank. Um, so when you compare the blue and orange line, you see that uh, SPF50 is slightly faster and also for the gamma case. So they call this the gamma trick, which is essentially uh, complex to real transforms. Um, also for this case, it is faster. And on the right side, um, you can see the scaling once you enable multi-threading. Um, so this is run with two MPI ranks uh, and one rank per socket uh, and you increasing number of threads available for the computation can see quite a bit better speed up with the library. Um, of course, far from perfect. That's in part because you have to sort of fixed part that's non-scalable of the MPI communication. Yeah, so this is it's my presentation about SPFFT. If you are interested to use it, it's actually available already in the latest uh, Debian release and also Ubuntu 20.04. You can just straight up install it from the repositories. Uh, otherwise, you can check it out on GitHub. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. Anything Thanks, Simon. Uh, so the, again, like with Cosmos, there were no 
questions appearing during the talk. I think so. The the message from us would be that so yes, we have a library. It's Rockm enabled. It's GPU enabled. And please, if you want to to try and use FFTs, uh, oxidated FFTs, do not try to recreate it, but have a look at what we have done. Maybe it will help you very much. Uh, yes, and so this John, John uh, DJ ask, is asking, what's the difference between 36 threads and two times 18 threads? Uh, well, if you have a single node with, um, let me go back, it's probably here, yeah. Um, then you could also run, you have essentially 36 cores available on the node, but these are on two processes which are on different sockets. So there you typically pay a price in terms of where the memory is. So it's often better to just run uh, at least one MPI uh, rank per socket, even though you're on the same node. Okay, so next question. So we can we have time for one more question from Vasilios. What's the other codes that can benefit from these libraries from the SPFFT apart from CPTK and Quantum Espresso? I can take this question. Uh, I think so. Any any material science code that is actually doing sphere uh, translation from a sphere of plane wave coefficients to a box can benefit. So I I'm pretty sure I will need of VASP or full potential codes like FLOR, they all have this type of data distribution and transformations and they can all benefit. Quantum Espresso for sure. Okay, and uh, now I think it's actually my turn. I am now start, I will now start screen sharing for myself. Uh, where is this? Uh, Oops, sorry, I have to be quick. Uh, I'm starting a screen share of the of my presentation about Sirius library and I have to find out how to make it full screen. Yes. Yes. Uh, do you see the screen? I, I don't. Yes, we see it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, Sirius is, is our like say bigger libraries and then uh, in, a, in a sense that it, it does a little bit more than a simple operation. Uh, so the motivation to, to develop, so it's a plain wave DFT library and so the motivation to develop it was the following. So we have uh, plenty of full potential codes like FLIR, Win2K, Exciting, Elk and so in essence, they do the same thing. So at the end, so we'll get the total energy and forces and stress tensor. So if you are, if your basis is saturated in terms of in, in full potential code, you will get exactly the same numbers. And if you have a pseudo potential code like quantum express, so I will need to wasp. And if you match pseudo potentials, again, so the answer will get the same answer for total energy stress and forces because you're doing exactly the same think in all these codes. And uh, actually there is also a lot of uh, common functionality between full potential and pseudo potential codes like Bessel functions, Gaunt coefficients, the way you store K points, the way you create G vectors, GK vectors, it's, it's the same. And for us it makes no sense to, to work on a different individual code and accelerate it one by one. It just doesn't so it's, for us, it's a waste of resources, of human resources. And it's much more efficient for us to focus on, on, on one single library, which we can then attach to different codes and accelerate, accelerate them through this library. And that's why Sirius was created. So why we develop it and why we promote it. So it's a collection of C++ classes uh, that abstract away the building blocks of, of plain wave for full potential uh, codes and it's written in C++ with MPI, OpenMP and CUDA Rockham backends. So we have, we are hosted on GitHub. So we also have a documentation. And it's pretty simple to build if you have all the dependencies installed, but it's also very simple to install dependencies either with SPAC or with easy build. So we use CMake as our building tool 
as actually DBCSR and SP15 and Cosmo are using. So we are fans of, fans of CMake. Uh, and in terms of functionality, so as I said, it's it's basically full potential and pseudo potential engines, ground state only, no excited states. But you can run basic things like magnetic, non magnetic uh, calculations, norm conserving, ultra soft PW. You can have spin orbit. Uh, of the interesting functionalities that we have, and it's not much attention is paid, but uh, we have, for example, iterative solver for full potential. So if you have, for example, a big molecule in a box that you want to run precisely, not with a plane wave code, but with the full potential code, we can do it avoiding the huge diagonalization of the uh, LAPW matrix. And we are also working right now at the orbital transformation method, which will help us to converge this 10% of, of input uh, structures for which do not converge normally so that ECF does not it just diverges and quantum espresso cannot converge them and yes we're working on this orbital transformation method so Sirius as I said is built on top of uh, of basic libraries like Elpa, Scalapark, uh, CUDA we have SSP FFT of Simon Frasch now as a hard dependency so we fully rely on the performance of SPFFT and then so you can compose uh, either a full SCF cycle, so you can run Sirius as a black box, so just given atomic positions, and you at the end you will get back energy, forces, and stress. Or you can use components one by one if you want. So for example, you can solve the band problem with Sirius and get back wave functions and construct charge density on your code. So in terms of uh, quantum express, so that we uh, first project that we did, so we interfaced Quantum Espresso with Sirius, and in this case, Quantum Espresso will do mixing and potential generation, so this lightweight stuff, but the heavyweight stuff as uh, Eigen problem and charge density summation will be done by Sirius. So it's in production at CSCS for quite some time, and so we are always in sync with the main Q repository. Uh, it's a bit of a pity that it wasn't mentioned during the QE webinar, on previous time, but just for you to know that uh, quantum espresso can be also accelerated by Sirius and the number of lines that we had to change is relatively small compared with the CUDA Fortran implementation. At the same time, we have reasonable speed ups because the blue bars that we have here is the dual socket uh, Haswell node and we compare it with the CPU plus a GPU node. So this is like factor two between these two nodes that we can get in terms of performance speed up. But because our webinar is more about or tilted towards CP2K, I would also like to mention that from the version 7 or 7.1, uh, Sirius is now interfaced with CP2K. It became a part of the, of the standard release. And uh, how you can use it is, if you know that CP2K is a Gaussian uh, it's a, it uses pseudo potentials, but it's a localized basis. But suppose you want to rerun your input file with Quantum Espresso. And if you want to do it, so you have to match input, so you have to create input parameter or input file for Quantum Espresso, you have to create the pseudo potential that CP2K is using for Quantum Espresso, and then you have to set up and run it. But you can actually do it. Uh, inside CP2K from now on. So you have to just uh, take a standard input file for CP2K and insert some uh, parameters that are related to Sirius, like a cutoff, a plane wave cutoff, GK cutoff, uh, K point mesh, all the basic things that you input, uh, that you have to input in PWX input files, in a quantum express input file. So you specify, you exchange correlation functionals, and then you have to specify the pseudo potentials. And so you have two options. You can either take, so in this example, so you can either take a CP2K pseudo potential, this GTH potential that is encoded in CP2K, or you can convert the UPF file with the utility that we have. So you can convert it to JSON file and then CP2K will pass this information to Sirius and Sirius will parse the JSON file and read all the information from, from this file. Once you have this one, so you can actually run CP2K and at the end you will get a 
a result, so you will get a total energy, or you can get stress and forces as well, as that as you would run the quantum express. So you will get the same number as you run the quantum express. This might be very helpful. And we actually have a, a collaboration running so that uh, people validate uh, the Gaussian uh, results by running CP2K in a serious mode with plane waves. Uh, the more, so there is a the big uh, documentation, there's more documentation is in their web page. So it's all described, it's all uh, written there. And basically, that's it. So the message from, from me is that CP2K from now on has a plane wave pseudo potential functionality like quantum espresso. And we're also working, it's a proof of concept, but we're also working on enabling the full potential uh, functionality. So we didn't test it, but it should be a matter of few weeks to tweak it. So we can give instead of pseudo potential species, you can give full potential species, and then you can run CP2K with the LAPW engine at the back. And that's it from my side. And we have some time for questions and answers. We can take questions. Anton, you have two questions, I think, pending. How these libraries work with exascale applications? I think that's the question to all of us. And uh, the answer uh, would be that uh, we are we are like trying to to work with as many users as possible. And for example, Marco, he is now in a contact with the user from Summit, where they try to run really a huge matrix multiplication on few thousand of Summit nodes. So it's it's working. And for for Sirius, for example, again, uh, so it's used by the group of Nicola Marzari where they do high throughput calculations. So they spawn with either a lot of jobs. And so these are small jobs, but it's a lot of them. And it's, it's, it's working. Uh, what's the, so second question from uh, Clotilde is, what's the difference between quantum express pseudo potential and GTH in CP2K? Well, uh, GTH in CP2K, it's it's a non-conserving uh, GTH, so it's a special form of a non-conserving pseudo potential, and CP2K is using only this one, while uh, quantum express is more flexible. So you have PAW pseudo potentials, you have ultra soft and non-conserving, and there is like a lot of libraries for pseudo potentials. So in in this sense, the uh, if you use CP2K with uh, in a serious mode so you can either use their pseudo potentials and then you will just benchmark the difference so you bench you will benchmark the gaussian basis sets or you can use uh, a pseudo potential from the quantum espresso community thanks i use cp2k toolchain to install cp2k and other codes dimitri thanks yes i use dimitri is it's not a question it's a statement Yes, Dmitri asked a question earlier and I typed the answer in the uh, answer box. That was a follow-up. Is Sir a uh, question from Thomas? Is Sirius PCP to case supports PW pseudo potentials? Yes. So as, as long as you can convert uh, any of the quantum express pseudo potentials to JSON, and so we hope in the future that quantum express will get XML schema and XML pseudo potentials, such that this conversion step will be avoided. So we will be able to directly read the XML files of quantum express. So yes, any pseudo potential of quantum express can be used in CP2K series example. Uh, a question about toolchain in CP2K. Uh, I've tried to install CP2K in our cluster, but I was faced the problem with toolchain. Would you recommend any other way to install it? That's a very good question. I think the toolchain of CP2K, you have to, to work or you have to ask how to use it. I I'm on your side with this question, so I, I honestly believe that it should change the toolchain a little bit. So, but it's the way how the developers recommend to install CP2K. So it's better to ask them in the forum what's the problem is. Maybe I can jump in. There's a Google CP2K Google group that is extremely helpful and very responsive. So if you post your question there, uh, Google group will be happy to help. 
Thanks, Roshana. So next question from Gerald. Are you, are you actively supporting installation of your libraries with SPAC? Uh, and the question is, uh, in general, yes. So we love SPAC and I think Cosma, yes, SP50, yep. SP50, Sirius have SPAC recipes. DBCSR, I'm not sure, probably yes. But in general, yes, we love SPAC and we like to, we, we support SPAC recipes. Could you say a word about CDFT calculations within CP2K? Uh, unfortunately, no, because of the reason that we are not CP2K main developers. We do not know what a CDFT is. We are uh, developers of the libraries. And there are no more open questions. So I think uh, we can, I have one assignment from Francesco uh, from the uh, trusted group. Uh, to announce the date of the next webinar, which will be about the FLIR code on the 9th of September. And that's that's it. Francesco, do we have to to say something else or we can... No, you said pre up? pretty much everything. And I thank you very much for your, uh, for your moderation role today, Anton. And uh, yeah, we are taking a break of a couple of months with the max webinar series and we will be back on the 9th of september with a fleur webinar so that's that's all on our side and uh, again thank you all to you to the speakers for your wonderful job and to the attendees as well so i'll leave it to you the closer rant on yeah well no thanks for 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 all listeners it was pleasure to to talk to you Thanks for trusted team to, for organization of such a nice webinar and we are just in time, one hour. Thank you very much for all.